Hi, this is Hacking the Afterlife podcast. For this next class, we are delighted to welcome Richard Martini back this year for a very unique discussion on talking to divine councils in the afterlife. Richard is a best-selling author and an award-winning writer-director. His eight books about the afterlife have all been number one in their genre on Kindle. He has written and or directed eight theatrical features and curated historical content for the films Salt and Amelia. His documentaries include Journey into Tibet with Robert Thurman, Talking to Bill Paxton, and Flipside. His latest book is Tuning into the Afterlife, And his most recent documentary is Hacking the Afterlife. And so, Richard, it's my great pleasure to welcome you back to our program again this year. You gave such a lively presentation for us last year. We're dying to know what you might share this year. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate it. Uh, And it's such a treat to see you there sitting, looking over that pond at Menla. What a treat. Uh, I've been fortunate in this lifetime to have been out to Menla a couple of times. And welcome, welcome everybody. Um, We're going to have some fun and I'm gonna take you on a weird adventure. Um, I'm sure that, you know, when people talk about life and they talk about the afterlife, we do have a lot of, people are usually associating stress. I mean, it's a topic that usually is involved with not a lot of comedy, Um, but unfortunately, your trusty narrator uh, kind of sees the world through the glass full. The latest book, and I'm sorry I didn't change the, the bio so it makes more sense, but this is the latest book. It's called Divine Councils in the Afterlife, which is the name of the talk, so it's not like that of a surprise. But basically, um, I wanted to do a little bit of a recap of where we were for those who didn't see me last time. The reason this photograph is up is because that's Mount Kailash. That is known as the wish wish fulfilling gem. I told the story last time on how uh, Robert Thurman, Bob had said to me, Tens and Bob had said to me, if you make a wish on this spot, it'll come true. And I was really debating, jaded Hollywood guy, a uh, million dollars or, or a three picture movie deal. And I couldn't make up my mind. So I thought, well, whatever comes out of my mouth, that's going to be my wish. And what came out of my mouth was I want a son, which was an unusual thing for me to say. We had a daughter. I wasn't planning to have more children, but, and I thought, oh, this must be some sort of a genetic code male thing. But then about a year and a half later, did have a son. And and then a couple of years later, we were driving on Santa Monica and I looked in the rearview mirror, this little face in the car seat, and I just asked RJ, it's his name. I said, RJ, do you uh, remember me from before? And he said, yeah. I said, where did you meet me? He said, Tibet. I said, where in Tibet? He said, on the path. I thought, wow, I was on a lot of paths in Tibet, but then I remembered the wish. And I said, wait a minute, was it Kailash? And he said, no. So then I thought, okay, a lot of paths in Tibet. But then I remembered, the, he's very specific. I said, was it Kangra? And he said, yes, Kangra is the name of this path that goes around Mount Kailash. So then a couple of years later, I was working on the movie Salt. Um, Angelique Jolie, that's what I do, film guy. And my wife called me on the set and she said, did you show him this book? I said, what book is that? Apparently he had gone to the library of the house we were subletting and he pulled two books out of the library, threw one in the trash. He said, this one's worthless. This one is the important one. And it was Robert Thurman's book with Tad Wise, Circling the Sacred Mountain with a picture of Kailash on the cover. He opened it up, pointed to the path and said, that's where I found daddy. So here we are with the wish fulfilling gem that has put me on this path because 
when we got off the mountain, we went over to Lake Mansarovar. By the way, anybody who wants to take the trip around Kailash with Robert Thurman, there's a film that's on YouTube for free, Journey into Tibet with Robert Thurman. We put it up online so you can take the trip. But somewhere at the end of the film, we're at Lake Mansarovar and we're with a sadhu who lives in a cave overlooking the sacred lake. And as we interviewed him, he said, you know, you people come here, I'm paraphrasing. He said, you come here and you think that you conquer this mountain when you go around it. He said, the mountain conquers you because it gives you what you're supposed to do in life. It allows you to change your path and your journey. And so when I try to point to what am I doing here talking about the afterlife? all these years later 2004 it's because of this mountain um i also have mentioned and very briefly i'll say again for those of you who know my work that it was my friend lawana anders who passed away in my arms in 1996 and she started visiting me and at first i thought like any jaded skeptic oh i'm imagining this but then she started appearing to friends of mine and family members who could see her and saying the same things. And I realized if I'm, I'm in denial, I'm, I'm refusing to believe it's possible. Why am I doing that? And if it's possible for her to come visit me, maybe it's possible for me to visit her. And that's when I started researching this topic of how do you access people on the other side, on the flip side? Um, and I'll talk about that. But basically, Luana Anders, an actress who was in over uh, 300 movies and TV shows, put me on this path. And I have these little slides that I'm going to add. So when I started this research, I decided to focus on the data because that's science. So these are, there's a couple of these guys that are mind science candidate, candidates who are professors, scientists who work with His Holiness and Robert Thurman in the Mind Science Project, for those of you who are aware of it, one on the upper corner, that's Mario Beauregard. Mario appears in my book, It's a Wonderful Afterlife, great interview. He had an epiphany as a child where he suddenly felt everything was connected and he spent his life as a scientist trying to figure out what that epiphany meant how everything seemed like like it's it's like he tapped into the matrix of consciousness and so he's been writing about that dr grayson who i met at the university of virginia medical school lab dops department of Perspe perceptual studies pardon me and he wrote this wonderful book after about thousands of near-death experiences that he's studied as a psychiatrist there um he's really great with logic it's impeccable. He's got a wonderful talk on YouTube called Is Consciousness Produced by the Brain? In the left corner, we have John Tucker, Jim Tucker, sorry, Dr. Tucker uh, is running the part that Ian Stevenson created where they've done thousands of reincarnation case studies. His book before is based on 1,500 of those historically accurate studies, people who can recall living before. Uh, and then Dr. Kelly, who um, his work is peer reviewed studies. It's not for the layman, but Consciousness Unbound and Irreducible Mind. Both of these books are fantastic for the skeptics of the world who really want to know this idea, you know, does consciousness exist outside the brain? I say start at UVA and you'll learn that these guys have been, and women, uh, Ed Kelly, uh, I think his wife has also written, but they have demonstrated that consciousness is not confined to the brain, which is really kind of what we're talking about. How is it that consciousness enters the body? How is it that consciousness leaves the body? And then how can we get to councils on the other side? That's kind of what this talk is about. And I'm going to try to do these as quick as I can in terms of not wasting everybody's time while I click <laughs> things. So I began working with and studying hypnotherapists. This was one way. Now, I, I just have to mention that in, doc, in Dr. Grayson's book, after page 127, he talks about filters on the brain. 
The brain filters out, works like a stereo receiver. It filters out waves or frequencies that aren't conducive to survival. That's the quote. The point being that this information is out there. It's just that the brain filters it. Or like a stereo, there's limiters that block out unwarranted information, which would be, which would include everything we've ever done on planet. However, some people naturally bypass those filters. Some children up to the age of eight uh, don't have the filters. They see grandma, they remember previous lifetimes. Some people just prior to passing, elderly, dementia, the filters appear to be dying with the brain and they see grandma, they remember things. Uh, but as Dr. Grayson notes, the postmortem autopsies show the brains had atrophied. So they shouldn't have remembered anything, but they do. So how do you bypass the filters? And what I've during doing this flip side research, I I saw that or you know became aware of the fact that hypnotherapy. We'll get to meditation in a minute, but hypnotherapy is one method of bypassing the filters. In Michael Newton's case, Journey of Souls. He came up with this technique that was four to six hours of uh, hypnotherapy, hypnosis. People would see past lives. They would be in the between lives stage. And that's where I first heard a mention of councils in the afterlife. He called them the wisdom makers or wise beings. Dr. Brian Weiss had 4,000 cases that he's documented, many lives, many masters, people remembering previous lifetimes. Dr. Helen Wamba, not so well known, but a really excellent researcher, clinical case studies that she did back in the 70s, which mirror everybody else's work because she's getting the same hallmarks in her work. Paul Oren, former uh, president of the Newton Institute. He's in New York City. He works frequently with Dr. Ivan Alexander. They go around and talks. You know him, proof of life. Scott Fitzgerald de Tamble is my pal out here in Los Angeles, trained by quite a few hypnotherapists. I refer to him as the virtuoso of hypnotherapy. He, I've filmed many, many cases with him, maybe 30. Out of the 100, I filmed 100 hypnotherapy sessions and then 100 meditation sessions. And what's unusual and uncanny is that they have the same hallmarks each time. And then I got a call from Jennifer Schaefer, a medium who works with law enforcement. Members of the FBI, members of the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, Bill Bratton from New York City, former commissioner, all have had her help them with cases. She works pro bono. We became friends. And about eight years ago, we started filming every week like an hour conversation with somebody no longer on the planet. That became our podcast, Hacking the Afterlife, which you can find online. Kimberly Babcock, also Raylene Nuanez and Jamie Butler, all of these people I filmed sessions with and asked specific questions to. Kim, Raylene and Jennifer all spoke directly to my friend, Bill Paxton, who had passed away. I had them ask him the same questions to see if the data changed. And each one of them was correct in terms of where where we met, what we did, you know, what we were doing at the same time, etc. In the corner, I have a picture of me and Kutala, the Oracle of State Oracle of Tibet. I just want to point out he's doing mediumship in a different way. We'll talk a little bit later about Tsongkhapa and how he used a medium in his work. And then James von Prague, who I don't personally know, but when I worked on the Charles Grodin show on CNBC, I had him on a couple of times. And in one instance, the film Hacking the Afterlife is the latest one, it's at Gaia. It's in the film where he accesses my friend Luana Anders and, and asks her specific questions that I had that prove that she still exists, at least to my mind. And again, proof, it's really reflexive. It's just what we can do. But now we're gonna get to the really interesting thing. And this is why we're here, Benla, because there we are, meditating in front of Mount Kailash, the wish fulfilling gem. Bob Thurman's in there somewhere. Is that Bob with the red? Yeah, big jacket. Um, Josh David, a number of other people, there were 25 of us who went to Tibet together. And Bob would do these guided meditations, which are impeccable. They're stellar. 
Uh, the Jewel Tree of Tibet, I highly recommend reading it. Uh, it's a fantastic way to deal with anger. But the reason I mention it is because I could hear somebody who knew how to visualize things and lead us in a guided meditation. And so in the Jewel Tree of Tibet, you picture yourself in front of a lake and you imagine a tree coming out of that lake. And if you can do that, then you are participating in a guided meditation. You're ideating what he's suggesting, but you're seeing things. And this is kind of the fundamental, uh, what I'm gonna be talking about in terms of what we're doing. So um, in terms of meditation, accessing people on the other side, how do we, how do we uh, characterize whether this is accurate or not? So you're seeing a tree, is everyone seeing the same tree? No, it's like a rainbow. Everyone sees a rainbow differently from where their perspective is. But if you see someone in the tree, let's say in that meditation, he invites people to put someone they really have a lot of faith in or love, or they think of it as unconditional love. It could be a family member. It could be somebody on the planet. It could be somebody off the planet. It doesn't matter. The point is, if you ask that person in the tree, a series of questions, the same questions, and everyone doing the meditation gets the same answers, then it appears as if we're talking to someone no longer on the planet, you see? It's something that Dr. Grayson mentions in his book after, which is, as science, you know, you wanna get, data has to be consistent and reproducible to become data. So the argument is, a near-death experience is a subjective experience. Of course it is. But as he points out, you can get objective data from asking people who've had a subjective experience the same questions. It's how all medicine comes to market, where the medical company asks the people who tried the medicine the identical questions. And then from there, from that survey, you have a data set. So I'm trying in my sort of weird, you know, I'm a filmmaker way trying to get a data set i ask people on the flip side people that are accessing somebody the same questions to see what they say and then i compare those answers to the thousands of case studies from dr wamba dr weiss michael newton newton institute the 200 people i've filmed half without hypnosis that's i'm just laying the groundwork for what we're doing here which is talking about how to access somebody not on the planet. All right? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. So uh, also I just wanted to point out some people use alternate methods to bypass the filters. Uh, sometimes they do it in dreams. Sometimes they do it using hallucinogens. As we know, ketamine has been used recently for helping people with PTSD. And if you ask those users, what the doctor told them, they'll say, I've heard this before, the doctor will say, you may run into somebody during the session that you don't know or that you do know. You know, don't, be, don't worry about that. So that's like a common thing of running into. It's also in near-death experiences. Even Alexander talked about meeting somebody uh, during his experience that he never met before, doesn't know, but he felt like he knew for a long time. Later on after the session, it turned out that he had a sister that he had never met who had died before he knew that he had a sister. And when they sent him a photograph, the, because he was adopted, the birth family sent him a photograph of his sister, he recognized her as the person who had been leading him around the flip side or the afterlife or whatever you want to call it. I try not to use the word afterlife. Sorry, we're in a conference about the afterlife, but because what people say is that we're fully conscious prior to incarnation, that while we're here because of these filters on the human brain, we're not aware of what's where we came from or how this process worked, but we can be through dreams, through hypnotherapy, through mediumship, through meditation, through hallucinogens, near death experiences, out of body, anything that's consciousness altering, allows us to access information. And my point is, 
Once you're accessing it, try to ask the same questions to get a data set of what that might be. So here we are, we're doing our meditation and I'm going, oh, sorry, so, <laughs> wrong button. Sorry about that. Uh, we're gonna be doing, we're gonna get to the actual meditation in a bit. But before we get there, let's just talk about what happens when you cross over. What, what do people see? What is the consistent thing people see? Is that it? Is that what people see? It's kind of lovely. I mean, you know, from a religious aspect, of course, those are the groups of people who've been talking about this for so long. But let's not forget that this particular religion is only a couple thousand years old. People on the, have been on the planet for 80,000 years, civilization, different places. Uh, I met somebody who lives in Slovakia, and they said that 80,000 years around these thermal baths. There have been a lot of stories throughout those 80,000 years of people uh, accessing what happens. As we know, uh, in Australia, you've got civilization for at least 70,000 years, and they talk about dream time which is while you're awake is dream time and while you're asleep is closer to reality closer to what it's like on the flip side where things are not matter they're mental uh, i had an unusual conversation with mino a physicist who passed away through our through a medium and i asked what's it like for you he said well uh, everything is particle or wave. When I was on the planet, it felt more particle. And now where I'm at, it feels more wave. It's a mental world. But still, that's a lovely depiction of rising somewhere up, could be. Some people re you know, report they're instantly there, like literally a blink of an eye, that they just move up. Here's another version of it painted by a distant relative of mine, Tiziano. Um, and this is in Venice. And here's the Madonna heading up. And all of these people greeting her as she leaves. So, like I say, I've been filming people doing this for 10 years. And in over 200 examples that I can point to and written about, what is the predominant thing that people say about getting over to the flip side? Is it this? Is it trumpets? Sometimes people experience that, the trumpets and all that stuff. And then, the, and then I had one person describe, you know, that he rose up on a cloud and Jesus was there. And then once he got there, everybody sort of took off their costumes and started pushing a broom, sweeping up all the confetti. <laughs> it was like, Okay, we gave you the thing that you expected to find, but now you're home. So like, get back to work. But anyway, this is something that um, I thought, this is what people mostly describe. You're rounding third and you're going home. And by the way, that term home, it's been used consistently in every, every way that I've done this kind of research because I ask people, so, where did you go after this trauma or the hypnotherapist says where did you go after that lifetime they don't say limbo they don't say purgatory they don't say hell they don't even say heaven this one word that they use is that base right there home you're on your way home now what does home mean it's a metaphor clearly but it's it's the idea of uh non-judgment familiarity family, unconditional love. And that's the most common denominator that I've heard is people who give you or you feel uh, an expression of love that's a thousand times any experience you've ever had on, on the planet. This is not my opinion. This is not my theory and this is not my belief. I'm reporting that the majority, vast majority of people, uh, no one's ever said I had a negative experience. Musicians sometimes talk about, you know, the moment they passed away, they're walking through like a dark tunnel and then they walk up some stairs and now they're on a stage and their band is waiting and they're ready to play. And it's 
and suddenly there's a downbeat and wow they're right back into this feeling that they had when they used to perform on stage of kind of uh an epiphany an experience that's beyond something that we normally experience uh, sometimes people talk about the uh, feeling of being transported, like a transporter room, like on Star Trek, you know, and with your whatever the uh, ions would all come together. Um, I, people talk about that, swirling lights, and then they see themselves elsewhere, home. Uh, it could be a bucolic setting. It could be something else. Often, and we're going to get to this in a minute, you're met by pets. You're met by animals. And I've asked the animals, why, why are you there? And they, they, we'll hear about this in a second, they have said to give this person a soft landing. Now, I have to mention that um, Jennifer Schaefer and I do this podcast. And last Thursday, the last podcast, I was in the midst of talking and she said, oh, there's a dog here. His name is, I mean, I know Hira. Hira shows up quite a bit in our uh, in our talks. That's him in the corner. He's a Commodore. She said, Hira's here. I said, what does he want to say? I, he said, he's saying, he's reminding you to talk about animals in the afterlife for your talk on Sunday. So the reason I, and I wasn't going to, but here I am. And the reason is because of Hira. Hira that dog. So let me just tell you about Hira. Hira is the only Oscar nominated dog in the history of film. He was Oscar. He was nominated for the writing of the movie Greystoke. The writing is because Robert Town, who's right next to him, Robert Town wrote a screenplay based on the fact that he knew that his dog was sentient because I walked him for three years and the dog was quite unusual. He also, the, and so the movie Greystoke came out of that experience of knowing that animals are sentient and he, want, he wrote Greystoke from the point of view of the ape that raised Tarzan. Um, and also Chinatown, by the way, also is credited by Robert Town because he used to watch the dog running around Catalina. And this comes to a very unusual thing. I mentioned in the book Backstage wow. Pass, but where wow. I was interviewing uh, uh, the first talk is about. <laughs> sorry, somebody's mic just went off. I was interviewing uh, uh, Robert uh, online with Jennifer. Then I suggested that we ask Hira some questions. Uh, we had just talked to a friend, a mutual friend of ours who was on the flip side. But anyway, uh, Robert was skeptical like, what are you talking about? How do we talk to Hira? And Hira came through and reminded Robert of a time when he challenged a buffalo on Catalina. Jennifer could not have known that. I didn't know it, but Hira clearly did. And since then, he's come through quite often. And I'll just try to be succinct. What he says is animals understand incarnation, but humans do not. Animals in general don't transmigrate. Animals incarnate as animals. Uh, dogs can be a horse or some other animal that they choose to be. I know that in the Buddhist pantheon, the idea of a hierarchy of lower and lesser and all, all that, it's just not in the data. Uh, people can, it's in very rare cases. I've talked to people who've had, in all the th hundreds of cases, actually thousands of cases I've examined, there was one, a person who could remember being a fox in a previous lifetime. And the reason I give it some uh, credence is because when they were then asked what it was a lifetime before the being a fox, they recalled being a fox on another continent and had the details about what their family, the hutch was like, where they lived, you know, the siblings. What people don't really haven't really come to realize, no other way to put it, is that animals have their own world, just like we do. They have siblings, they have reasons for being here, they recognize us as frequency they report that they find us as much as we think we find them they report and they're accessible and you can ask them questions that it's they or who are finding us we have this illusion or that's their word for it that we're tracking them down or you know we go to the shelter and it turns out when we ask them that day 
their higher selves, just like we all have higher selves, we bring a portion of our conscious energy to a lifetime, according to the research, they too, the higher self influences us to get in the car and go to the shelter that day. All right, now I, I have these people up here just because I'm mentioning that these are all people that I've talked to on the flip side. Here's Paul Allen, Junior Seau, and Dave Duerson. They were all together because Paul uh, created the like a brain institute. And so we were talking to Paul after he passed away, Jennifer and I, and Junior and Dave came through and they wanted to thank him for doing that. I asked him why, and he pointed out it was because both of these guys had died from CTE, you know, the brain disease from football players. They wanted to thank him for doing that. And they also wanted to point out that Joe Namath, this is an unusual thing to hear, had cured his CTE using oxygen hyperbaric therapy. I did not know that, but I heard it from these two guys. They came through three different times to repeat that. Amelia Earhart has been a, a I, all I can say is she's shown up a number of times, mainly because I've spent 30 years uh, working on a story about her, but she talks about her journey. Uh, in the research, we had James Dean come through and we spoke to him. I asked him if he was planning to incarnate again, and he said, I already have. And then he said, and the person I am is somebody you know. Jennifer didn't know that I knew this person, and so I texted his best friend after he said that, and I said, I, did anybody ever say to your friend that you grew up with that he was a reincarnation of someone? And he texted back James Dean. And subsequently, I did a three-hour interview with this fella who, who has done all the things that James wanted to do. Marriage, uh, children, um, rodeo, um, all kinds of racing and other things that that I didn't know of this. But and so anyway, I had this interview with him and he had an interview with Jennifer. And it's not up to me to reveal who that is. That's all I can say is I asked, him, I said, why don't you, you know, let's make a documentary about it. He said, I'm just not interested. He's had a successful career. He's a successful actor. So it's one of those things where one day perhaps he'll come up with that. Carl Lemley, that's this person here. Carl Lemley came through a couple of weeks ago to talk to us about the movie All Quiet on the Western Front, a movie that he had purchased for his son to produce at Universal, the studio he created. And he talked about this woman who had kept the rights, the story, the remake rights, and that's what won the three Oscars. And he said she would. She had a dream 16 years ago that she was going to win an Oscar. She was a triathlete and, and she won a triathlon. And then she had this vision that she was going to win an Oscar. And so she moved to Hollywood, took her 16 years of trying to keep the rights to this story. And, and that's, that's anyway. So it's a fascinating thing to hear from Carl Lemley, the Oscar predictions. And he was accurate. It's, I know what I'm saying sounds completely wacky. But that brings us to this. So here we are. This is the book. Now, it's interesting. Does anybody recognize that photograph? Michelangelo from the Sistine Chapel. He was naked at one point, <laughs> and then the church came and covered him up. Sound familiar? But this idea of him going to the flip side, and when he gets to the other side, and we'll talk about Jesus in a minute, but I did want to just make one little detour here and mention this, which is when I went to college in Rome, I took a class with Peter Rockwell, Norman Rockwell's son, and we went and studied this statue. You know, it's in the news. You know, school principal was fired because they, they let a class of children see the statue, pornography. So I just want to point out something that's interesting. 500 years ago, a 25-year-old sculptor um, won a contest, which was a giant slab of Carrera marble. When he got the marble, there was a flaw in it. So he dug through the flaw all the way down to where it ended, and it ended right here on his left knee. And that's where the statue of David began. So he created this. Now, why is this such an important statue? Well, the Vatican, the church represented the giant. 
And David represented the people who were fighting against the giant. The Medici had opened the first public library. They were very tolerant of homosexuals. The whole idea was David was somebody who fought for the rights of people, of humanity. That's why the statue is so important. And the Pope sent a couple of assassins to murder the Medici family, the Pazzi conspiracy, something I worked on for years. I sold it to HBO. But basically, the idea that somebody would be fired from a school because of this statue 500 years ago, uh, really a statue about what the best of humanity is, but, you know, from a sculpture's point of view, and then you wonder, like, what planet are these people from? If they're <laughs> obsessed, horrified by the statue. But, and by the way, one other little tidbit is when the statue was unveiled by Michelangelo, the Florentine Senate came to see a private viewing, and one of the senators said, his nose is too big. And so uh, Michelangelo got on the scaffold. He went up with some marble dust in his hand that he had picked up off the floor and pretended to chip away at the nose, letting the dust fly, and turned to the senator and reportedly said, how's it now? And the senator went, better. So what are you going to do? We've been living with people that are not that bright for a long, long time on the planet. It does have to do a little bit with the flip side, which is, you know, why do we why do we put up with this nonsense when we can learn something so different? All right, so I'm going to move from that to this slide. So what what is it about? So I've mentioned all these people that I've talked to. Well, what what is a council? How do you get there? What's the story? And by the way, these are all of course, you recognize them. These are all what people might consider to be council members, people who are great, wise people. Uh, Padmasambhava, uh, Krishna, Ma Durga. Ma Durga has shown up in the research often. I'm, it's a completely a bizarre thing to say, but during one of our interviews, Jennifer Schaefer was talking to her father and uh, who had passed away. And I said, so what are you doing on the flip side? He said, I'm taking a class in astrophysics. And so I said, well, can we visit your class? And we went to the class and he said, now don't be frightened by when you see my teacher. Now he's talking to his daughter. She can see things, I can. And she said, the teacher has eight arms. I said, oh, that's interesting. And then I interviewed the teacher and I asked the teacher questions and what's your class like and how do you get in and blah, blah, blah. And then when, and then she mentioned that people on earth knew her as a deity. And so I went and I researched that and I found Ma Durga. And so I went, the next time that we were able to do this, I went back to the same class via Jennifer, via this trip. And I asked her and she said, yeah, that is the name that people refer to me as on earth. What we find is that people that appear on our council or on our panel as blue, Maybe because where they are from, where they incarnate, people look like that. I know that's a little bit hard for people to fathom because we've always considered these to be mythological people. But what the research is showing is that these mythological people may actually have basis in reality. I know that sounds weird. All right, but let's just talk about divine councils for a second. What is a quote unquote divine council? Where does the term come from? And if you look it up in Wikipedia, you'll find that um, divine councils are Sumerian, Akkadian, Egyptian, Babylonian, Canaanite, Israelite, Celtic, Greek, Roman, Nordic texts all have mentioned councils. Egyptians describe a synod of the gods. Mesopotamians called it an assembly of gods. In the Torah, multiple descriptions of Yahweh presiding over an assembly of heavenly hosts. Examples include the book of Job, where Lucifer, that fella, is reportedly on God's council. The book of Psalms, the book of Kings, where a prophet has a vision of Yahweh seated among, quote, the whole host of heaven to his right and left. In China, deities under the Jade Emperor were called celestial bureaucracy. Zeus and Hera preside over the divine council in Greek mythology. A council assists Odysseus in Homer's Odyssey. In ancient Rome, Jupiter presides over the Roman pantheon who prescribed punishment. In Celtic myths, 
The council is a family in Norse mythology. The gods are sitting on thrones of fate. And that comes from Wikipedia's version of the divine council. Uh, in terms of Buddhism, we don't see a lot of councils other than when uh, Buddha made his trip to the flip side. Let's just call it that for colloquial sake to fit with our conversation. And there he was aware of uh, non reincarnate deities, as he put it. So, but they also have the same, they follow the same path, which is, of course, the, it's not that people have a soul in the afterlife, which would be incorrect because it's conscious energy and it's always evolving, always changing. It's not a finite thing. I mean, that's to, to parse it and to, to sort of put a, some a weight of understanding it but the same goes for non reincarnate deities they're learning everyone's continually accumulating knowledge and moving and changing so it's not that i'm talking about a finite soul i'm avoiding the word altogether i call it conscious energy because it appears to be that way i have a picture here of tsongkhapa and the reason is uh when i was in when i was filming an interview in dharamsala i was talking to one of his holinesses uh, attendance, and he said that His Holiness had seen Tsongkhapa inside his meditation room. That one day he had walked in there, and Tsongkhapa was sitting there, and they had a conversation. Uh, and if you look at uh, the Buddha in the Land of Snows by Tim uh, Tupton Jimpa, he talks about how Kar the Tsong Tsongkhapa traveled with a monk named Umapa, who was a medium because he would help him ask questions about emptiness to people like Nagarjuna and other great pandits who are no longer on the planet. The idea being that this idea of asking a medium who is bypassing the filters, if they can give us some insight into something, that's a valid way of studying whatever philosophy you want to study, okay? Does that make sense? All right. So what do we learn once we're into the council? What do we learn about councils? Everyone has one. Everyone is connected to their council. The council members are trying to help us. And council members have their own guides and councils. In other words, they're not the end of the rope or the end of the road or the top of the tree. If you speak to a council member and you say, so who are you? Do you have a guide? Do you have a council member? They do. They talk about councils, councils. So if you can think of it like as a forest keeps going up, the trees keep going up. Um, all right. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about, a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to talk about back to where you know, the, the whole point of this talk, which is what is a council? How do you get there? And this is the most simple way I can put it. You get there with the Beatles. All right, you guys with me? Beatles? Any Beatles fan out there? All right. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, very good. I'm sorry. You know, I have a tendency to wind myself up, and I apologize for winding myself up. I just... I download and so I just wanted to ask anyway, this is this to me, this is uncanny and it, it's fun. Um, but so here I was. I'll just tell the genesis of this book. I'm having lunch with a, uh, a woman who I would call a jaded skeptic Hollywood movie producer who six years ago had allowed me to film her doing a hypnotherapy session something her doctor recommended because she was doing an operation. He said, hypnotherapy will help you relax. On the way to the session, she said, Rich, I don't believe anything if, that there's an afterlife or any of that stuff. And I said, well, let's see what, are, you know, we're, you're going to do the session. So let's just wait. Do you have a question to ask a guide? She goes, we're not going to find a guide. I said, oh, give me one. Cause you know, when we get there, Scott DeTambo is going to ask, do you have any questions? So she went, okay, fine. What or who is God? And when we got there, sure enough, you know, 15 minutes, she was remembering a previous lifetime that I could, I found, you know, the historic 
forensic research. But we get to her guide and the guide says, oh, you humans, you all think that naming something will help you handle it, get a handle on it. But look, God is beyond the capacity of the human brain to comprehend. It's not physically possible. However, if you want to experience God, you can do so by opening your heart to everyone and all things. And since then, I've really studied that sentence. And plus, I've talked to the same librarian, this guide, through other people who, who I'm talking to somebody, I've never met them, Harvard graduate. She says, I'm in my Akashic library, and the librarian is saying, he talked to you already. You've already asked him the same questions. And I asked the question is, what does that mean? Open your heart to everyone and all things. Compassion empathy, allowing the fact that we're all together, that consciousness is the thing that we need to become aware of so that we can open our hearts to each other. Your brother's keeper is you. And so if you just follow that for a second, and not in a religious sense, but a mathematical sense, What he's saying is, if you can open your heart to everyone and all things, you will experience the epiphany of what people report when, like Mario Beauregard, suddenly felt connected to all things on the planet and all people. Uh, Sir Francis Younghusband, leaving Lhasa in 1906, connected to everyone that he had met and all people and like every atom connection. So... That's what this woman had. So now here I am having lunch with her a few months ago. And I said, do you remember any of that? She said, no, (laughs) I don't remember any of that. It's vague. You know, I know that you wrote about it, but you know, it's vague. I said, well, would you like to revisit it? And she said, what do you mean? You mean now? I said, yeah, let's just do it without any hypnosis. Let's just see if we can do a guided meditation. And what came to mind was picture yourself in a boat on a river very simple. And when I say it, you all hear the Beatles singing it. So that's the question. Can you picture yourself in a boat? Start there. And now think about the boat. What does the boat look like? Is it small? Is it large? Is it plastic? Is it wood? What is the boat made of? You have it in your mind. And now look outside the boat. What body of water are you in? Are you in a lake? Are you in a river? Are you, can you see the shoreline? That's how I start each one. Picture yourself in a boat on a river. I don't know if you need the tangerine trees or marmalade skies. So now that you've got the person sitting in that boat, You ask and invite their guide to sit across from them. If they don't see anybody or can't access anything, you say, I say, whoever needs to come to be here to help, please sit down. And somebody does. Sometimes it's a grandparent. Sometimes it's somebody who's crossed over. Sometimes it's a light. I I don't really see anybody, I see a light. And then I say, well, can the light manifest as a person for ease of conversation? And and they can manifest, and I could say, I suggest, you know, I suggest manifest as anybody. It's just to make this conversation smoother. And then I ask the person to ask them to nod, shake their head, or shrug, because that's a form of communication. Ask them, is it okay to ask them questions? If they say, I don't get anything, they've got to, I then say, they've got a nod for us to go to the next question. So once they say, and most often they go, they said yes. And then I ask, are you familiar with me and what I'm doing? Some are, some are not. If they are not, I'll say, well, I'm not going to ask this person anything that will disrupt their path. But can we go visit their council? If they are aware, I already know. They orchestrated this meeting. Let's go to the council. Are we inside or outside? People see either 
inside, and it's a construct that they've come up with. It might be a temple, might be a church, a cathedral, or outside. It might be a garden. It might be a grove. Or sometimes it's in between, in outer space, but in a kind of bubble. Then I ask how many people are here. They are aware of a number. And if it's like a lot, 20, 30, 100, I say, is there a core group that we can discuss or talk with? Again, the guide knows what I'm doing. And if the guide doesn't, the council does. And then I say, well, let go to the first person on your left and let's ask them the same question. Is it okay to ask you questions? Do I have your permission? If they say yes, really rarely they go, no, this person isn't supposed to know this now. This is too early for them. But I, I can say in this book, I had 20 people. One's a Harvard neuroscientist whose name is in the book, Akira Wera Sakara. Uh, there's another neuroscientist. There's a, a Episcopal uh, minister. There's a hedge fund manager, the head of a studio, a film director. There's all kinds of people from all walks of life who have never been to a council, have no idea that they have a guide or have met this guide, let's say, but they all say the same things. So now we're in a room or outside somewhere and they name these people and they go to the first person on the far left and they start to talk about who this person is. And I ask the same questions. What do you represent on this council? All council members answer with a word. It could be courage, it could be advocacy, it could be history, it could be love, it could be wisdom, it could be knowledge. When I hear those two terms, I always ask, what's the difference? And they always say the same thing. Knowledge is something that you accumulate. Wisdom is something you already have. I ask them, are you on any other councils? Some of them say, no, this is the only council I'm on. Most of them say a few. Some of them say thousands. I'll ask, do you appear the same in each council? Some of them say yes. Some of them say my energy is what I choose to be depending upon the person that I'm talking to or the person I'm helping. They serve on councils. The part that gets a little unusual is that people sometimes see people who normally don't incarnate on earth. Call them aliens. As Stephen Hawking told us, we're all aliens because we choose to come here. But some of them are different, very different. To get over the fear of talking to somebody very different, I often say, can you hold their hand or touch some part of their body? And what's the feeling? And they always say, oh, I have familiarity or connection or love. And then from there, I ask the same questions. Who's this person? Then I ask to the council member, have you ever incarnated on the planet Earth? Sometimes they say no. One person, uh, well, let's call him a lizard looking fella. I mean, lizard's not the right term. He had like armor across his arms, which was a color of lizard, his eyes closed like this in the side, and he was very intelligent. He also said that he had spoken to me before. I said, so have you ever incarnated on earth? And he said, I wouldn't stoop so low. Now he was kidding, but the idea is there's a lot of controversy incarnating here because it's a yin yang world. It's got a lot of gravity. It's got a lot of surus. There's a lot of angst. One person said, you can learn more from a, more spiritually from a day of tragedy on earth in one day than you can in 500 years on some boring planet. So that implies that people who choose to come here, choose to incarnate, have courage. It's hard to come here. It's hard to experience this, but we do it to help others. People report we do it because we chose the part to play to help somebody else in the play. We can access in these divine councils or councils, we can access the life planning session. We can say, what was the life planning session? And they'll show it to them. Who volunteered? Who said, no thanks. I, I put my hand down. 
I'm sorry. Uh, did I say yes? I don't want to be. I already did that in the Viking era with you. I don't want to play that role. We ask people in the audience, would you help us? The other thing that councils are oversee is the life review. People come back here after their lifetime. And if they've been problematic, they'll get a dose of that from the council. Ah, remember that time you did this thing? Here's the, here's the weird part of it, which is they show it to these people firsthand. They experience, Kenneth Ring, Dr. Kenneth Ring talked about it. They experience the trauma they cause as if they're the victim. So it's a little bit of a, you know, people talk about this research and they're like, well, you're not talking about judgment. You're not talking about heaven or hell. You're not talking about good or bad. Well, it's pretty bad when you are in front of all the people that you incarnated with and all the people that you love over many lifetimes, and they're watching some horrific thing that you did to somebody else, but you're the person experiencing it. That's what's reported. It's, again, not my opinion about that. Oh, my gosh, look at Paul McCartney. He's just staring at us. Um, so here's what I recommend people do. I, I suggest... First of all, you ask for a guide to come forward. You ask about visiting the council. You describe the location. Are we inside or outside? Count the individuals. Start on the left. Ask permission to ask questions. Ask if they're aware, council members aware of why you're here. Some are. Sometimes I say, are you familiar with me? And they go, no, I've never heard of you. Who are you? The person next to them goes, oh, yeah, we've all heard about you, Richard. This is important work you're doing. One said, Oh, yeah, you're the troublemaker who asks tough questions. <laughs> Sorry. It was so weird to hear that, being chastised. Um, you ask them what quality they represent on the council. I ask if they've ever incarnated. If they're an alien, I'll ask, has this person I'm talking with ever incarnated on your planet? And that's an unusual. Would they say yes? I'll say, when you show it to them, what did they look like? So that person that looks like an alien and now the person who's recalling seeing themselves on a planet with this person and looking just like them. Um, I ask why they're allowing this session to happen. What's the benefit? And is there any benefit that humanity or a person can gain from this? And then I ask for lottery numbers. They never give them. I ask them. I used to get a laugh. But they don't give. And it is a weird thing because I always go, and what are the lottery numbers for this Friday? And then the person I'm talking to is very serious and uh, you know emotional about this thing. They go, they're all laughing. I don't know why they're laughing, but they're laughing because they, they know what I'm doing. Anyway, um, so I wanted to get to what some of these people say. Why is this work valuable? I'm, uh, this is quotes. From the recent book, again, people I've never met before who don't know my work, never read any of my books. I'm doing a Zoom session. It's been organized by my friend who, who saw the librarian because she was part of a meditation group. And it was her idea that I get 20 people together who didn't know me. One person said, it's like a bridge. We need lots of bridges. Why this work is important. It's a natural evolution of consciousness. It's becoming easier for people to access information because everything is becoming denser, they said. Not that the veil is getting closer, but because there is no veil. Another person's council member said, we know you, Richard. You're the troublemaker. Another said, this work is desperately needed these days. Healing people's consciousness will heal the planet. She recommended that people reconnect with nature. Humans used to communicate telepathically with nature, but technology disrupted the frequency. Again, council member talking, answering my question. Another person was told that we need to listen to animals, listen to each other. We've lost the ability to communicate with nature. Spend more time in nature, Medla, and listen. Another woman saw Jesus on her council. And when asked about this book, Divine Councils, before I'd written it, he said the book was spreading the gospel, which of course gospel means good news. He said, quote, people should know that we can communicate with them and how anyone can experience God if they open their heart. I'll give that to him. And another council, when asked an opinion about this research, a council member said, this work is key for the survival of human beings. 
Now, if somebody asked me um, about, so I, I, I maintain a forum on Quora called Hacking the Afterlife, and this woman wrote to me two days ago with the following, because I she'd read the book. Hello, Richard. And she's a yoga instructor, pain management specialist. I, fin I just finished listening to Divine Counsels of the Afterlife. I'd like to report that the Martini method of visiting your council worked for me. Just listening to Richard repeat the phrase, imagine you're in a boat on a river. I do practice meditation daily and I teach guided meditation, so it was simple for me. I did a grounding meditation and then started the visualization, imagining a boat on a river. I saw a canoe on a wide river with reeds growing on either side. I asked my spirit guide to appear and a rather muscular fellow appeared and introduced himself. I quizzed him a bit as he isn't a spirit guide I'd met before. I asked him if he could take me to my council and he said, yes. Next, I was in a white marble room with pillars and arch windows. I could see five globes of light, which I took to be my council. I thanked them for allowing me to visit them and proceeded with the martini method of going first to the council member on my left. Imagine my surprise to find a large green alien looking creature. And she puts in uh, parentheses, after reading the Divine Council's book, I was aware some council members may not be in human form. I asked whether his home planet was within our universe and he said no. He told me the Pleiades. She said it, she later looked this up. I asked what he represents in my council and he told me humility. I asked him if he had anything he'd like to say to me and he told me, lead with your heart, not with your head. Don't be afraid to take risk. The next member was an attractive brunette who was very warm and welcoming. We held hands. I asked her what she represents on my council and she said, love. I asked her how I was doing in this life and she told me I'm doing well, which is what pretty much everyone says. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. I asked her for any guidance she would like to offer and she said, focus on the present. That's all there is. The third council member was a typical looking gray alien with big black eyes and long fingers. I asked what he represented on my council and he told me conflict. He said, war and peace are interlinked and symbiotic. You cannot have peace without conflict. I asked him uh, what that was for and was told or something I needed to learn. She said, I'm not good with confrontation, that I need to be more comfortable and have better communication. It was overwhelming. The reason I mentioned this, because here's someone I don't know, I've never met, reporting that this simple technique that I've just told you worked for her. So that brings us to the uh, podcast, which is kind of fun. If anybody who's tuned into it, Hacking the Afterlife. Like I say, Jennifer and I, Jennifer Schaefer works for law enforcement. We've been doing this for eight years. And every, hey, there's me. <laughs> um, for eight years, for a week, every week, for eight years, sorry, um, for like an hour a week. And we talk to people on the other side. And I just, I tried it as an experiment because I was talking to people that I know. And I knew that when they answer the questions correctly. But since then, we've had so many unusual conversations. I talked, as an experiment, I talked to my friend's dad who uh, had Alzheimer's and he had a few weeks to live. And I wanted to know what it was like for him because again, people report, we bring a portion of our conscious energy to a lifetime. Usually that number is between 20 and 40%. I asked Jack Tracy uh, what, the amount was that he had now, and he said about 10%. I said, why is that? He said, well, it's like leaving a leg in the pool. 90% of him was already home. I said, why is it that you uh, haven't departed? He said, because I need all my grandchildren to come and say goodbye to me. I knew Jack very well. I knew his story. He verified who he was by telling me things about his dog, and they used to feed him a piece of toast every morning, stuff that Jennifer could never know. The point being, I've heard that consistently. And by the way, this woman who wrote me the other day then followed that up with her mother-in-law who has dementia and did the same kind of conversation where she's talking through a meditation, talking to the higher self of the dementia patient, asking, and this woman came through and said, I've been watching you and your daughter, and I can't believe your daughter's learned to speak French, and I'm very happy, and I'm fine, and don't worry about me. Everything's okay. I'm still here because there's still things that need to be learned. So it doesn't sound to us that we're learning anything, but on the flip side, they are aware of what's going on. 
And so tuning into hackingtheafterlife.com and you and Jennifer, by the way, for people who need a direct con trick con <laughs> conversation with somebody who just crossed over, Jennifer's very good at that. Um and, uh, you know, like I say, we've been doing it for two years as a podcast and eight years as friends and just research. So highly recommended. All right. And so that brings us back to this. And I just wanted to say this about that. Anybody can reach me at martini prods, P-R-O-D-S at gmail.com, jennifershafer.com, hackingtheafterlife.com. Um, so here's what I've learned. Anyone can bypass the filters with effort. Hypnotherapy, mediumship, and meditation can help. We can access our counsel because they want us to. They want us to know we're not alone. They want us to know we're never alone, that we're connected and they can assist us. We can go to Kailash in our minds. We don't have to make that trip. It's difficult. In fact, two people died in the, the group that were behind us. But you can go there in your mind. And I just think it's funny. I'm here to talk about the afterlife, but I'm reporting that there is no after, that we exist prior. We're not aware while on stage because of the filters. But once off stage, we are aware. We can access the backstage while we're still on stage. We can examine, ask questions about the process, how consciousness functions or incarnation works. We can visit our Akashic libraries, don't need a library card. We can talk to avatars we'd like to meet. We can visit classrooms on the flip side and our own councils. So I hope this helps. And Michael, I think that's it. Uh, and I'm here for questions. It's never it. Um, as we all know, and uh, that was definitely a highly un unusual, unconventional, and electrifying presentation. Um, I'm curious, uh, you know, to what degree you think we can all become mediums ourselves, right? You, you suggest, you seem to suggest everyone can do it. Absolutely, and that's a great question. Thank you. I am fond of saying it over and over again. It's like I was talking to uh, my friend Luana on the flip side, um, and I'm asking her questions, and I'm saying, now I'm through a medium. I'm not seeing her. Jennifer is. And I said, so what is it about the veil? Why is it so difficult for people, this veil thing? And she said, there is no veil. The veil is a construct. We convince ourselves Cells, you can't, we can't access them. But as as I've discovered, I mean, I've done six hypnotherapy sessions. The first one I did uh, with Jimmy Quast of Eastern Hypnosis, I didn't think I was going to go anywhere. I was a skeptic. I didn't believe there was an afterlife. I wasn't sure that I had had previous lifetimes. I, I just, but I, as a filmmaker, I was like, oh, I have to see. I have to prove that it's false. Unfortunately, that's how it happened. And somewhere along the line, I saw myself, I saw a previous life, I had all these adventures. And then two years later, I'm out in Los Angeles and I'm talking to Scott DeTamble, lightbetweenlives.com. And I say to Scotty, well, Scott says, why don't we do another session? I thought, oh, great, I'll see if it was false, you know, that I was making that up. And he starts counting me down. And he got three, sentence, three seconds in and I said, you don't need to count anymore. It was like the garden gate had been left open in my backyard. I saw myself walking right through that gate. And now here I was two years later, but 20 seconds later from where I had left it the, the previous two years earlier. Uh -huh. I had this experience of being in a classroom and interrupting everybody. And now here I was two years later. And now the friend I had interrupted was having me stand in front of the teacher and apologize. She was apologizing. It was like this was happening and it was like, you know, the actor's dream, nightmare. You wake up on stage and you want to know where you are, Shakespeare. <laughs> I was there and the teacher's looking at me, this eight foot tall green fella. And he's saying, so what's your question? And I was like, where am I? Anyway, we're all mediums to answer your question. We are all mediums. We come here as mediums. 
But the filters block that information. If you think about it, why is the why block that information? Well, imagine if you could remember all of your previous lifetimes. You know, the guy giving you a pizza slice is the guy who poisoned you in the Roman era. <laughs> and you're like, ah, I'm not going to. Or, you know, you owe me money. Whatever that is, all those memories, it's not just selective. You would remember everything. However, you can visit your Akashic records. I've filmed people doing that, going in with a guide or a teacher or the librarian and then asking, show me an event that I'm not aware of that had some detrimental thing to my life. And, you know, some people see them as as volumes. Some people see them as a video monitor. Some people see them as virtual reality, like they step into a scene and and now they're showing you something you know and and they're and they're giving you this information so that you can make your life better again i do ask the question to council members all right say it i don't want to disrupt this person's life not everybody signs up to know how the play ends mm -hmm. and and not everybody's supposed to i had one fella who uh, an old friend of mine he wanted to try a session and so we get to the session and about three or four hours went by of him saying i don't see anything nothing's happening so finally scott said to his guide who he did see why are we preventing him from accessing this information and he said he can't handle it mm -hmm. this is this is going to disrupt his path entirely <clears throat> of who he is as a person so scott who's very clever said um well what can you show him and suddenly everything opened up that he could show him present day stuff, huh. uh, you know, the interactions. So there was a problematic previous lifetime that obviously they didn't want to show him because that's what he was asking for, you know. And of course, when you do this research, I'll tell you, there's two amazing uh, sessions. One's in the movie Flip Side, which is at Gaia, and the other one's in the film Hacking the Afterlife um, with a friend of mine. Uh, both both people remember dying in uh, the Holocaust, one in Auschwitz and one in Dachau. And here they are accessing these horrific events. And when they got back home to their council, they asked, why? Why did I allow myself to go through that? I lost everybody. And this one woman in Flipside, it was really the first person I filmed, she said, they're showing me that it was harder to play the role of a perpetrator in this lifetime than that of a victim. Wow. And then she went on to say that every day in the camp was like a PhD in compassion and forgiveness and courage, mm -hmm. but that the people who played the other role were gonna suffer over many lifetimes for their actions, mm -hmm. that things get out of control. The other guy, the, a friend of mine, he was a very successful television producer and he was asked, like, why did it like 11 year old girl? And, and he saw the whole events of her dying in Dachau. And he said, when he was talking to the council, I wanted to experience the dark. I had had so many lifetimes in the light. I wanted to see what the darkness was. But oh, my God, that was that scorched my soul is the way he put it. It was so. And so Scott said, is there any way we can help you? And he said, they're showing me that my counsel is leading me into the river of souls. And he said, and so I'm bathing in this water of all of lifetimes that are rushing past me and it's soothing me and it's healing this scorch in my soul. That's wow. the way you put it. Yeah. So, you know, people ask me like, why do you use this metaphor of a play? It's the best I can, I can come up with because what people report, especially when you're talking about a life planning session, they're accessing who they cast, who they ask to cast, you know, who's going to be in the play, why they're doing the play, what they're supposed to learn. We talk about karma, which is action or energy in Sanskrit. So they choose a particular action that they haven't mastered yet. Mm -hmm. It's a different way of looking at karma because you're asking to be given that task. Then when you're on stage, again, because of the human physiology, it's blocked from you why you got on stage, how you got on stage. You're just living your life and you're enjoying it. 
you're tasting things. You come here to taste and touch and feel and emotion, the highs and lows, the roller coaster, all the insanity that goes on here. But a lot of it's pizza and cappuccinos, at least for me. And, you know, those are things that you you come back to enjoy that you can't really get over there. Of course, listen, Carl Lemley brought came through and I just briefly showed him. And I said, so what's it like for you over there? Because he passed in 1939. He said, you get to travel to other realms. You can fly at the speed of thought. You can create worlds, structures, buildings. You can participate in any sport that you can possibly think of. And others come to join you within that. He said, when you get, when we get bored with creating these other scenarios, that's when we decide to reincarnate. Huh. Weird way to put it, but you know, here's a guy who created cinema, Universal Pictures, and he was talking about this, you know, something I couldn't have come up with and something that I'm sure Jennifer couldn't have come up with, but this idea, and it's consistent in the reporting, which is, oh, for example, Gary Shandling, you know, the great comedian. We spoke to him after he passed, and I said, So what are you doing? He said, playing golf. I said, Oh, <laughs> you know, how do you do that? He said, Well, I create the the golf courses out of places I've been. And other people that play with me, they create golf courses out of places they've been. And sometimes we might even actually use a golf course when <laughs> nobody else is around. And I said, so what do you play, like 36 holes? And he said, no, two. The tees are very far apart. <laughs> Which is a hilarious joke. But neither one of us could have come up with it. But, you know, listen, the point is they exist they're not gone. They're just not here. And they want, they, and that includes your council members, that includes your guides, that includes your family members, right. your classmates. They want to communicate with you. They've tried. Most people give up. You know, they come in, they turn the lights on and off, and you go, ah! Or, you know, my daughter uh, was, was three, and she jumped up and ran out of the kitchen, and she said, Grandpa's in the kitchen. Now, my instinct was to jump up to see my father, but I sat there because I this before I'd done this research, it just started. I was like, what does he want? And she said, he wants to see the baby and her little brother had just been born. I said, does he have any message for us? She looked around the house. She said, well, he says I love you very much, but you guys need a bigger house because there was toys everywhere. <laughs> my father, the architect, exactly what he would have said. Um, and I've heard this many, 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 many times. I tell my friends who have toddlers, um, look, I know the toddlers, they don't have the filters yet. You see, the skull doesn't harden until the age of eight. So you can ask toddlers these questions. Mm -hmm. Did we choose you or did you choose us? It's a non-denominational question. And you'll be shocked at what they say because they go, Oh yeah, come on. You were my father like three lifetimes ago. And I was really annoyed by that, but you know, blah, blah, blah. I've had many, many friends, you know, report back to me like the most uncanny things that their children said to them once they were asked a simple question. Mm. What, what is your journey like, you know? And, you know, I think I, I mentioned a little bit, my son, his first sentence to me when he was two, I was in Chicago and I was on the telephone and he said, Dad, I was a monk in Nepal. I said, what? Put your mother on the phone. He said, Why did he say that? She goes, I have no idea. It was his first sentence. And so now we start talking about it. And then he, you know, he said that thing about Kailash. That's where he found me. But then some years later, uh, he was in a Tibet shop here in uh, L.A. in Topanga Canyon, a Bhutan shop, and he disappeared. And my wife was like, I can't find it. It was a small shop. And she, I said, well, he's got to be here somewhere. So she finds him in the back room. He's doing full prostrations all the way down to the ground, forehead down to the ground, back and up. He had never seen that in his life. And he was doing, and she, my wife said she watched him for like three minutes. Wow. And then he saw her in the mirror, like busted. And then she went, oh, and he went, oh, mom, you need to meditate more. And this is how you do it. And then he pulled her down to the ground and he said, you hear those bells? You hear those bells in Tibetan music? When you hear a bell, it means peace comes into the world. I'd never heard that. So I've talked to a Tibetan former monk friend. And I said, what does it mean when you hear a bell? 
in Tibetan music. He said it means peace comes into the world. Finally, when he was about six, uh, I sat him down and I said, look, grandma has passed or is about to pass away and we're all going to go to Chicago. And I just wanted you to be aware that when you see her again, she's going to be in a box, you know, with makeup on. Uh, that was disconcerting to me when I first, you know, experienced that. And sure. he laughed. He went, <laughs> Dad. He picked up a bottle of water and he went, Spirit is like water. Watch. And he threw the bottle down to the ground and then he started jumping on it, smashing it, jumping up and down. My wife and I looked at each other like, What is he doing? Then he picked up the bottle, which was completely flattened. But the cap was on and he said you see the water's okay <laughs> easily the most profound teaching i've ever heard about the nature of spirit yeah we need to get your son on the next time sounds like well you know he, that goes away it does go up the age of eight well that's what they say right and that that's that's but when you have me as your dad <laughs> <laughs> every now and then when i need a when i have a question because, uh, well, this is the other weird thing. His sister remembered him because one day they were looking at pictures of the Patala and I had uh, brought a book home from Tibet and I overheard this conversation and he said, I used to live there, pointed to the Patala. And she said, no, you didn't. You lived here. And she pointed to Mensikong where, you know, the- uh -huh, Right next door. Right next door. In Lhasa, yeah. She said, that's where you lived. I lived over here. She pointed to the white building because you were from the land of no people. I was from the land of people. And then she said, and when he died, we all took care of him. He was a very uh, old Lama. And when he died, his robes fell away completely. He, he went into light and his robes fell away. Now I looked up a rainbow death, which is, you know, when you go lock yourself. Yeah, we just into, talked about that in the last session. Yeah, rainbow body. So, body. so, so and, and here she was claiming that that happened with him so one day i sat down with him and i said no we're going to do a meditation i didn't tell him what it was about and i said i want you to describe what a rainbow body is and he just suddenly he just said you become the light you become the rainbow you become the energy of the light and the energy of the rainbow and i said were you able to do this i mean i've heard it where you know that's where you transition and you disappear he said i did it three times in my life I said, so yeah. that means you were able to come back from that. And he said, yes, that's correct. Yeah, that, I've heard stories like this. Yep. So from Tibet. Okay, I, 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 that's great to corroborate that. It's mind bending. It sure is. Um, so there were a few questions about, um, oh, I wanted to say actually one thing, which was about, uh, oh yeah, what you, uh, you mentioned slightly earlier that uh, you know if if the council were to reveal or or whatever was to reveal too much for one that it wouldn't be sort of acceptable to your wherever what you're ready for yeah and i've heard bob say this like if buddhas are omni competent and <laughs> omni you know conscious why wouldn't they just blast you into enlightenment right Right. And the answer is supposedly that you wouldn't handle it. You would you would run from that explosion of awareness the way that you might run away from a bomb. Well, that's uh, that's interesting. And I love the way that Bob puts that, because, of course, you know, he's got that apocalyptic stuff right at the tip of his tongue. I would I would put it from a professor's point of view, which sure. is like. You know, it's like using AI to finish your exam. You know, you're like, mm -hmm. yeah, there's the exam. It's done. Did you learn anything? And people do in their in their council meetings protest. You know, they go so it, because the council says, "So how have you done?" I mean, Michael Newton mentions this in one of his books, and this guy came forward and said, "You know, I was I was a, a patron of the arts, and I gave money away, and I helped a lot of people." And they said, "No, no, who did you help?" And he went, I, I, no, I helped a lot of people. I, you know, I gave every, and they said, no, no, who? Uh -huh. And then they showed him that once when he was on a bus, there was a woman crying and sobbing. It was during the depression. She had lost everything. And he had put his arm around her and had said, it's going to be okay. And they showed him how that moment changed her life in waves. Wow. And went out and helped other people. 
So, you know, this thing of, of, you know, being aware, look, the Bodhisattva's journey is to come back, as we know. And it was Bob who on the other side of Kailash had said to me, the question I would ask Buddha is, I thought you were a Bodhisattva. Why didn't you come back? Mm -hmm. The idea that (laughs) you come back to help others and to assist in others. And so the same thing goes for your journey. You know, are you at the end of your journey? So I asked my guide, how did you become a guide? And the way he described it was that when uh, all of his lifetimes were done, that his grad and he went in the he graduated to become a guide, his graduation gift was me. And that how he had sat with me before I even incarnated and worked out the canvas of what I was going to do. Hmm. And how after each lifetime, you step back and you look at the canvas and you go, more red, more blue. I think you need more violence here. You're not learning, whatever. Uh And then after all those, I graduate, but then you keep graduating. Because let's say I graduate to be a guide, then I might be a guy in a council, but councils have councils and they have guides. So I might continue (laughs) be going on and on and on. It, not that it's a, a negative thing, but you you just continue to help, put that way. And, and to learn, no, totally. And and how could we expect to do it all like you know in one life, instantaneously, or you know lottery numbers, <laughs> right? So we had a couple questions about these filters <clears throat> early on. Um, uh, so Victoria asked, "Do you believe that the filters on the brain or in the consciousness are an evolutionary adaptation?" Or um, it's a good know, question. What, what's their purpose? So no. I, I, the reason that uh, the Harvard neuroscientist uh, Akila Werasakara reached out to me on Quora is because he had been studying this phenomenon, and there was a woman named Viola Pettit, uh, I forget her second last name, who had studied as a scientist in the 1960s, and she had done a number of. Uh, sort of trans channeling sessions where she was talking to a higher scientist who was explaining this to her. So, and, and the question is, is where is the filter? Because if you could figure out where the filters were, mm-hmm. right? Hello, where's that pill? I think I'll take the pill. And then, you know, for six hours, I got the filter off. Or, you know, is it some, you know, on some people, is the filter less? And just what you pointed out, mediums. If you look at mediums, and there's a guy at, uh, I think it's in Pennsylvania, Penn, who has done studies of MRIs of mediums. Hmm. So the question is, if mediums, and so, you know, clairaudient, clairsentient, clair whatever, um, Jennifer Schaefer can see people, outlines, smell them, um, and, and hear them. So she's got all of those. So if you did put her... And then I asked her father to show her, her father on the flip side, to show her in the Akashic Library what caused that. And he showed an event when she had uh, a, a fever and, and, you know, like a super high fever and that parts of her brain, it's like got burned off. So yeah. are the filters, do they exist somewhere? Again, as Grayson noted, when the brain atrophies in dementia patients, when they do the postmortem autopsies, they the, the, the lobes have you know, turn to charcoal. So the, so the filters must exist because they're dying, you see? So the, they must have something to do with the brain uh-huh. and they must have something. So there may be a locus, we don't know. And so that would be, yes, it would be a Nobel prize if you could figure out how to t- turn the filters on or off. Because then you see telepathy is what what they're talking about. So an alien shows up here. We have a problem with communicating with them because we can't, we don't know how to do that. Animals on the planet already have that ability. They have telepathy. Right. right. So we have to figure out what it is. They, you know, dogs can smell Even cancer. Even ants do, right? That's right. Dogs smell cancer. Elephants can communicate up to 10 miles. Birds know when to mate six months in advance of bad weather patterns. Octopuses know more in one year of life with eight brains than we do in 80 years with one brain, you know, shape shifting anyone. <laughs> but the idea that if we could figure out what nature already has given the creatures on this planet, then we might be able to go back to the idea. And I've heard this, by the way, 
you know, I talked about sacred groves. Somebody sees a tree in their grove. I'll say, can you go over and hug that tree? What's that feel like? They always describe a sentient being within that tree that is representing it. And then I ask the tree the same questions. And in one tree, I asked, you know, what do we do about climate change? And the tree said, plant a trillion trees. Mm -hmm. Why would we do that? He said, because it'll lower, it'll increase oxygen, lower the carbon, and lower the temperature. I mean, it's logical, but I had never right. thought of it. Anyway, and what the tree said was, humans used to be able to communicate with us, but have forgotten how. You need to start listening again. Oh my gosh, it couldn't be more clear than that, right? Yeah, pretty. And I in, I found a guy in a redwood forest talking to a tree. I mean, he had his hand up on this tree and he was like talking. And I thought, oh, well, this is interesting. So I filmed an interview with this dude who who has, you know, that's his thing. He can do that. And so I said, have you ever had a conversation with a tree of something that you weren't consciously aware of, but the tree made you aware of it? He said, yes, he was in Brooklyn. He was he never been in this this grove before. He was talking to this tree and the tree seemed very upset. And he asked the tree what the problem was. And the tree said, go around the, the park there on the other side and you'll see. And he went over there and somebody had dumped toxic waste in a small grove of trees that was killing those trees. Oh, wow, uh, yeah. So he, my point is it's new information. <clears throat> it can't be cryptomnesia. It can't be something he saw, read, heard, watched in a movie, read in a book, heard Rich Martini talking about on a flip side podcast, new information, something that he didn't know that he learned. I mean, yes, it's hard to deny these experiences, especially if you've had one yourself. I think that's key, by the way, Michael, it's the, the experience outweighs theory, outweighs belief when you've talked to your loved one or learned something new from them yep that changes the paradigm i mean i'll give you one example harry dean stanton was a great skeptic an atheist i knew harry he would spend hours at dantana's in la arguing life ends nothing fear uh -huh. blah, whatever <laughs> so when he passed away I, I i organized this session to talk to him and he i said harry your memorial's coming up next week what do you want me to say he said, tell people to believe in the afterlife. I said, oh, come on, man. Your memorial is going to have all the atheists in L.A. <laughs> and he said, so he gave me three private messages to give to people at the really close friends of his that only Harry could know about their health condition. Uh -huh. So when I, when I passed along those messages, they were flabbergasted. He also told us that there were five women at his deathbed and that he was given that a child was there waiting for him. And it was a child that he had lost, that, you know, that didn't come to birth or to term in 1960s. Hmm. And so I was at the memorial. I said, so who was with Harry when he died? This woman said, well, there were five people in the room. I said, well, five women. I said, did he say anything weird? And she said, yeah, he asked me to hand him the baby. But what Harry said to tell these people, which I did, is believe in the possibility of an afterlife and then you won't waste another minute of your life arguing about it like i did nice mr quantum leap <laughs> well, no, that's around. dean stockwell oh that's, uh, that's another guy that i worked with dean started my film limit up um i haven't had a conversation with dean and i should but you know but so, harry dean stanton pretty in pink and i'm sorry i'm uh, yeah i totally mixed that's them. all right so he doesn't care it's fine he likes being quoted so do you do the mediumship or do you work with other mediums or like, and, and, and how can people, can people book you to talk to deceased loved ones or how does this work? That's a great question. I generally, I work with mediums who work with law enforcement. So I know how effective they are. Um, and, but when I work with mediums, they go, well, you, you have this ability too. But like I say, everybody does. Right. Uh, what I, what I've what I've done with people people do hire me and have paid me to and I do it by donation whatever but they have hired me to do these council sessions and the first twenty in the book uh, whatever this is called hacking the afterlife <laughs> um, the first twenty are part of this experiment and the last thirty 
are people that I've, you know, either reached out to me, contacted me. One is an Episcopal minister who had, his wife had done a session with Jennifer Shaver and Jennifer Shaver, you know, will say to people, you should, con- you know, contact Rich about doing these things. So they huh. can if they really want to, but I, I recommend people seek, uh, try a hypnotherapist. You know, the Newton Institute has a searchable database. I, like I said, I'd recommend Scott to Tamble. He works on Zoom. Then mediums, jenniferschafer.com. She's very talented. But if you've exhausted all that and you're ready to take this other leap, then yeah, you can reach out to me at Martini Prods at Gmail. And, you know, I, I don't mean to sound, it's just that I. No, I love that you're not trying to sell yourself. I was just curious. Um, yeah, no, I, and I, the re, I mentioned it that way because, look, I'm just a student. I'm trying to learn. I'm I'm a filmmaker, and of course, I'm waiting to get the brass ring again. I've you know written a directed a bunch of movies that nobody's seen, <laughs> and so I'm still trying that. You know, and once somebody goes rich, you know, we're gonna do your movie. I'll be like, okay, finally, huh, I can stop all this. You know, talking to the flip side. I'm kidding, but you know, I appreciate the question. Sure, and then there, here's a great question from Tumoy. What about privacy? I really don't want my dad seeing me nude. <laughs> <laughs> it is a common question, and there's two ways to answer it. One is, get over it, dude. You know, here's the, that's really both ways. Because, you know, look, they're aware of the process. We aren't. We think we're hidden and everything's secret. And that's another interesting thing, which is people on the flip side report when you run into somebody, you don't oh i'll 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 give you the better best example dick clark the famous Uh dick clark so we jennifer and i are having a podcast she goes dick clark is here i'm like why i didn't invite him what's he want he starts talking about what it was like on the flip side he uh, he answers my questions he said his animals greeted him that gave him a soft landing and then i said so what do you miss about being on the planet he said the mystery i said what do you mean he said, when you meet somebody on the planet, you learn a little bit, you fall in love with them a little at a time. Over there, you get a full download of everything they've ever done. So think about that for a second. You run into somebody on the flip side, your brother, your aunt, your uncle, everything they've ever done over all their lifetimes is suddenly accessible to you. You understand why they play the role in your life, but you also understand everything about them and so nudity doesn't become much of an issue when you're in that state or off stage it's like looking at somebody on stage who's taken off their clothes you know for like a second or two you might go oh that's weird like they're naked on stage and after a few seconds you're like what's the story what's the drama what's the Mm. story about and they're aware of uh, our humility or or you know, whatever they're aware of our foibles sense of shame right our yeah. sense of shame and and for them it's like oh please dude leave that on stage those are props those are costumes the skin costume and by the way when you run into somebody on the flip side they project the image they want you to see i'll give you a quick example new york cop detective I was talking about this stuff on the movie Salt, pulls me into a room and he goes like, my daughter claims to see a ghost. Like, is my house house possessed? I said, wait a minute, who's the ghost? She said, well, daddy, he looks like you. He dresses like you. So I said to him, do you know anybody that fits that bill? She said, yeah. He said, yeah, my partner died 10 years ago, but my daughter's eight. So when she saw him, she said, I I showed her a picture of him. She said, yeah, that's him, except he's skinnier now and he has hair. So he wanted to know, well, how could he appear thinner? People appear as they like to appear. Uh Uh-huh, in our 20s. Yeah, but he's wearing the uniform so she could identify him, you see? And I said, so, the, I said, did you like this guy? He said, I loved him. I said, so the guy that you loved is watching over your daughter while you're on duty. Does that sound like a possession? He said, not when you put it that way. (laughs) I have to say, when I when I first um, was in the same room with the Dalai Lama, I felt that sense of total nakedness, and it was it was pretty disconcerting. I have to say, I mean, there was a, a like elation and wonder and amazement, sense of love, thank gratitude, but like, how do you holy feel now? Smokes, you know, like he could see every part of me, uh, and that, you know, like I know exactly being. what you're talking about. 
my experience with him, I was with Bob in Dharamsala, but he had to leave. And so he said to me, say this to him. So I got in the long line and I was up there and uh, a Tibetan merchant had handed me a book written by Tsongkhapa, it was in gold. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, would you carry this for me? It's too heavy. So I got up there and I swear to God, I had like a moment where my brain just froze because I, I was like just staring into the distance and I heard people yelling my name and the line had moved all the way up to him. I was about a hundred feet away. Something happened like outside of time. Yep. So I go up and I hand him the, the book and I said the thing that Bob told me to say, and he put his forehead against mine Uh huh. and he said something, you know, and it might've been a Tibetan, but I didn't understand it, but I thought, okay, this is a little odd. He's got his, and he just left it there. He said something. And so now a few minutes later we went, somebody took a picture of us. And so it looks like I'm glowing, but when I try to access that moment, it was like he wasn't there. Right. It was like he was not in the same space. Anyway, so yeah, what a wonderful ability to see a person like him in our lifetime. Oh, by the way, this is fun. Um, Charles Bell, have you ever heard of him? He's the guy yes. who wrote. Okay, so Charles wrote the book about. But no, tell everybody just briefly. Okay, Charles Bell was a, a British diplomat who helped the 13th Dalai Lama when they had he had to escape from Tibet. First, because the British invaded, then the Chinese invaded, and they became best friends. And when the Dalai Lama, 13th, went back to Lhasa, he invited Bell with him. And Bell lived for the next, I don't know, seven, eight, 13 years. And he wrote a fantastic book about the 13th. So me, weird dude that I am, I thought, well, following the logic of what I'm saying, your higher self is always back home, and a percentage of yourself is here. I did a session where I invited Charles Bell to come forward. Oh, interesting. And we interviewed Charles. Now, Jennifer didn't know anything about Charles Bell, but she knew, you know, he's showing me, uh, you know, a lot, he's showing me this, you know, Asian town, blah, blah, blah. And then I said, now I want you to talk to the guy that he was friends with. And she described the 13th to a T. Wow. How he looked, this mustache, the way it curled up on ends. Sure. And, and what he was saying. And so I then proceeded to interview him. Oh, my goodness. About yes. his life, about his journey, about how he could exist outside of time, but that his emanation or a portion of his conscious energy is on the planet. Now, I don't know. On some, that, that should be against the law. I don't know that you should, you could be talking to somebody's like, what are they really doing? You know, what are the lottery number, whatever. Anyway. Oh yeah. You I, and the lottery numbers, right? That's right. But I did it as an experiment to see if it was possible because I'm a huge fan. And I, I, I wrote a screenplay about that whole uh, adventure that young husband had in Lhasa which no one will make because of the Chinese, you know, uh, That's right. whatever, Not yet. But whatever. Um, and it was fascinating to hear that. And it's just a proof of concept for me, you know, anybody else listening to that would say, Oh, come on. You know, that's crazy. But hey, I thought you'd get a kick out of that. Like, I, and I do. And I did. Um, <clears throat> so you asked me, you told me I might have to cut you off. Okay. Uh, because we could go, I could go on for another couple hours here, but uh, we, we have come past our time in this session if there's like oh there's a burning question is there a burning question all right one more from tumoy how can you tell if you're channeling another spirit or having a past life like memory exactly oh, well and the question is also like how can you if you're meditating on answers how do you know you're not making it up and I heard right. this wonderful meta uh, point from Michael Newton who was off planet but showed up to pass along this information. And it's in the film Hacking the Afterlife because I filmed it on camera because I took out my camera when Jennifer said, Michael Newton's here. And I said to him, so give us a one, two, three. How do we reach out to our friends? And he said, say their name. Mm -hmm. I said, do you say it aloud or in your head? He said, it doesn't matter, Richard. Right. He said, then ask them questions. And he said, that's it, there's only two. And I said, well, wait a second. How do you know if the answers are made up or, or if they're real? He said, when they answer the question before you can ask it, you'll know you've made a connection. Whoa. Meaning when you're doing a meditation and you're talking to your guide and you start to ask a question, like, can we go visit my council? 
and they say yes before you would say can we you don't even get to the question it happens all the time when you uh. do these kind of conversations they can anticipate what you're talking about because they're outside of time they're accessing you know this in a in a different way right and i'm, I'm sorry was the question about past lives or was it about talking well, to in, in other words like i guess i don't you know it's hard to say. It's like, you know, so even like if you're visiting a previous life of your own, oh, right? whether that's are you actually channeling another spirit or, or oh, are you having well, a memory? Listen, that's the Carl Jung thought. And I've talked to Carl about that to, to ask him what his opinion is now. But that idea that there's a pool of consciousness out there floating around in deep space and that we just tap into that. OK, so how do you access that? Because you can you're asking your guide to take you and show you these things and while you're seeing these things you start to ask date time place who was there in that lifetime that's in my lifetime now mm -hmm. you're getting more and more details and data you write all that down and then you do the forensic research my example is when i did my first session i saw myself as a lakota medicine man i didn't believe it i thought it was silly mm -hmm. but Six months later, I'm at a funeral in, in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and this person says, oh, I'm a, I'm a historian for Lakota." I said, oh, well, let me tell you what I saw. I saw myself as a Lakota. He said, wait a minute, what were you wearing? I said, buckskin. He said, how many feathers? I said, two. He said, were they up or down? I said, down. He said, well, that means you were a medicine man. I said, oh, okay. Well, what about my name? I heard this name, Watanka. And he said, well, Wakantanka means the great spirit. So that is a derivation of that. So that would be your name. I said, wait a minute. I said that the Huron had wiped out my tribe and hmm. killed my wife and taken my son. And he said, well, you're sitting in the spot where they fought for 60 years. Now, none of that I could find online. But I eventually found the answer because then he showed me these books where I could look up all that stuff. So the thing is, is think of it as research. Try not to think of it as sacrosanct. You're playing a game. Right. You're playing the Jumanji game. What can I learn from this? And again, they're not going to show you stuff you're not supposed to know, but they will show you stuff that you are supposed to know. So write it down, research it. You don't have to walk around saying, well, I was on the Titanic. You know, maybe you were on a boat that sank. You have to walk around the ship to find a buoy that has the name of the ship. Try not to focus so much on the hierarchy which we do here. Oh, Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you were the guy who swept up Cleopatra's room. That's why you're remembering her. Try not to focus on that. Focus on what's the key. Why did you choose that lifetime? Mm -hmm. Why did you choose this lifetime? And what thematically do they have in common? Because that's where you find the answers to why you're on the planet. You've had these lifetimes before, doctor, nurse, teacher, lawyer whatever or soldier you know mayhem or whatever all those colors on the canvas that we talked about yeah those are all part of your journey and you can see the theme and in my case i asked my counsel what the heck did i choose richard for and they said as a filmmaker you when you make somebody laugh you can change their disposition instantly one said tears work but they require catharsis Mm -hmm. word I've never used in a sentence. He said, but you chose this journey so that you can share film with people, which will heal them. And I didn't even understand it until today, because you see the films I've made help people access their journey and why they took them. And it has nothing to do with me. I'm just filming them talking about it. You see? Awesome. I cannot thank you enough for your sense of playfulness and humor uh, and, you know, approaching such a far out topic. Um, so I, I any questions we didn't get to martini prods at gmail.com. I'm happy to or Quora hacking the afterlife forum. I do answer a lot of questions there. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Richard. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Love, love. <laughs> this has been Hacking the Afterlife Podcast. For more information, jenniferschafer.com, richmartini.com, or martinizone.com.
This has been Hacking the Afterlife Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you on the flip side.